Hey everyone, thanks for watching. I have a very interesting show today. We're doing something a little bit different. Uh, first and foremost, we're gonna have a couple of people speaking, uh, but we're actually having uh, someone from the Philippines on. We're gonna talk about virtual assistants. Uh, so let's welcome David Richter to the show, as well as John Cruz. How are you doing this morning, David? Oh, great, doing great. So, so David, you, uh, you wrote a book called Less Stress, More Profit. Uh, why don't you, uh, first off, give it a flash, right? Highlight it for uh, right, the audience. Right there you go. Less stress, more profit. Get it yep. on Amazon. Uh, why don't yep. you go ahead and talk about real quickly what it is uh, and what it is and what you do, uh, and then we'll ask John to in introduce himself. Uh, folks, for watching this on YouTube, just a heads up, John, uh, we're just going to hear the audios. We don't have a camera, but uh, the audio is great, so we decided to, to keep going. So, David, go ahead and introduce yourself. Sure. I've got a company called Simple CFO Solutions, and around that, this will stress more profit. That book kind of came from that because what I do is help investors, specifically real estate investors, know their numbers. So you need to make sure you know if your business is actually profitable and healthy. The second thing I help is to make automate your profit, basically a system around paying yourself first. You've probably heard that for your own finances, like The Richest Man in Babylon. They talk about that in that book. So there's that the other book, Profit First, if you've ever read that book, which I highly recommend by Mike Michalowicz. That's the system around where we actually implementing automating your profit. And then the third portion that's discussed in this book is really how to make and keep more profit and how can we actually grow your business. And that's why I have John too. John's been a key part in actual real estate companies. And I've actually, my background for the past six years, I've been in the trenches of real estate, been working with a company that's done 30 deals a month, 300 deals in a year, sat in every seat from acquisition, sales, finance, project management, property management, basically any seat you can think of that does wholesaling, retailing all of that stuff, uh, lease optioning. So I've sat in all those seats and John has too, the virtual assistant and my, he's actually my integrator, my COO operations manager of Simple CFO Solutions because he does such a good job. So I know we're gonna go into that second part, but that's really what Simple CFO Solutions is all about and the Less Stress, More Profit book is really about knowing your numbers, automating your profit and making more profit. And that's what, our unique flavor is basically we've sat in those seats. We've seen a lot of different ways to do it and not to do it. And how can we actually help you know the numbers you actually need to know to make and keep more profit, cut the expenses you really don't need, and then also take it from not just the financial point of view, but the actual holistic point of view and say, in your company, how can we help you grow? So that's really what this book is about and what our company is about, because I've seen in the last few months, especially, it seems like a lot of people are like, the recession is coming. You know, we are always saying that we always want to be prepared. And that's really what we're trying to do is help investors become recession proof when the next recession comes, no matter what. A lot of good people that I know lost a lot of houses and a lot of their businesses in 2008 and nine. And that's something I'm really trying to steer people away from is doing that again, where they're just they're built on the bubble. And you really can't be built on the bubble. You need to know your financials and have the good profit in your bank account to be able to weather the storm. So that's really why I wrote the book. So that way, those investors that are struggling or don't really know their numbers or think they have good, they're doing a great job, but then the next bubble comes and it mm -hmm. bursts, then they can't weather that storm. And that's really what it's about, helping investors weather that next storm. Very, very cool. So we're going to peel that apart a little bit, but let's, uh, let's give Mr. Cruz, John Cruz, a chance to introduce himself and highlight his experience in this real estate game. How are you doing, John? Yes, hi, I'm doing great. Uh, thank you for asking. Yeah, so my name is John. I've been working with real estate investors for the past, I think, four years. Yeah, I've been with the acquisitions department, uh, marketing department, property management, and bookkeeping services for real estate investors. So, um, yeah, I've been doing that for four years. Very cool, John. Thank you very much. Thanks for, thanks. What is it? What time is it for you right now? Cause uh, I'm well, like, right now it's, yeah, it's 11 in the evening. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. I mean, they usually yeah. start you know, yeah. during these hours. Yeah. No, no, so it's, it's actually, not, I guess if it's starting at 11, that's, that's rough. Okay. I got you. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, thank you for joining. All right. So, um, 
I guess David, a little bit more, uh, or I'm, yeah, David, a little bit more about your experience. So it sounds like John's been doing this the last four years, which is awesome. Which we're, I'm going to ask him a bunch of questions about being a virtual assistant. Uh, but what you know, when you were working at these companies doing 30 deals a month or 300 deals a year, uh, have you been in this cycle kind of the same duration the last four years, or does your experience extend back to 2008? No. I actually started myself with my very first house and that was about 2000 and I want to say 11 okay. when I was about 19, I bought my first house then. So I bought it when the, when it was basically at the bottom. So yeah. I made great money on the first deal. I had my first deal myself was like, I I've got super tenant in there. He paid early. He cashed me out of a lease option within six months. Mm. So my first personal experience was like the wonder experience where I was like, okay, something nothing went wrong really with that first deal so i'm like okay what's going on right exactly when i got with a company and we were doing high volume then i was like oh okay this is all the things that can go wrong you know with with you know deals that in real estate so that's really i've been in it for probably full time the last six years and probably for the last eight to ten years where i've been doing my own deals kind of on the side too Okay. Very, very cool. So, uh, you know, so let's talk about, cause uh, you know, I think a lot of people watching this, um, I don't know, think, think doing 30 deals a month is like, like they can't, they probably think they can't get there. Um, and, and maybe for lots of people, they shouldn't get there cause they don't have the infrastructure and processes and, and all of that. Uh, but when you sort of step back and peel back a business that's doing even a couple of transactions a month, where do you see, um, where do you see kind of the process breakdown and where, where, where are you helping? Because again, I think you're right. Uh, there's a lot of businesses built on the success of the last five years, which was frankly easy. And, um, maybe not, maybe they're not checking their numbers and, you know, maybe they're not paying themselves. So, um, you know, talk about some experiences and some things you've seen out there just to, just to hopefully wake people up. Sure. I'd say it's two key points. I'm going to try and keep it as simple as possible. Mm -hmm. Number one, do you have a marketing system that will continue to generate the deals and the leads that you need no matter what the cycle comes at? So if you are dependent on one type of lead coming in there, you're depending on one thing that could go away at any time. At the, at the height of the depression, basically, or the last recession, we were doing a lot of HUD deals. And those dried up eventually. So we had to go to like straight to seller deals. So it's like you have to constantly be shifting. But if, as long as you have a marketing system that keeps bringing in those deals, you always have to have marketing. So I don't want people thinking, oh, I'm just on the financial side. The financial side is the result. I'm very results driven. So I like doing the financials because that shows that you've actually have a company and you're actually making the money from the deals that you're creating. But what's just as important as that is making sure you have a marketing system that is making sure that you have an actual business that can sustain no matter what. So that way you keep getting the deals you need in order to live and eat, but then also to build your wealth. Then the second part of that that goes just hand in hand is once you actually make that money, I mean, you, you're you out there, you're busting your butt getting those deals. Once you've actually done that, you need a system to manage the money that's in your account. So that way you can say, hey, I've got some nuts stored up for the next winter. <laughs> so that way you actually have, if a downturn does come and you're, and you still have that marketing system, but maybe the buyers are, you don't have as many buyers, you don't have as many sellers or whatever the case, if you've got something stored up from what you're actually doing now, it's going to be able to weather that a whole lot better if you see a little downturn in your own business. So if you have that marketing system and then an actual system to handle the money that you actually make, that you've made from going out there and doing those deals, you'll be able to weather that next storm. And that's what I think a lot of people miss is, hey, sales, marketing, operations, I've got all these systems, isn't it awesome? But then at the end of the day, they're not really profitable or they're not managing that profit to say, hey, we need to be able to, to make sure that we can cover ourselves if this were all to go away overnight and we had to totally switch our business model. Yeah. Very, very cool. So, so let's, let's dive into the topic of virtual assistants. We'll give the first question to you again, David, and then we'll, we'll bring okay. John back in. Um, so I think a lot of real estate investors have heard about virtual assistants. A lot of them believe that should be their first hire, uh, but maybe some people haven't. So why don't, you, why don't you first highlight how virtual assistants help, how they can help, um, 
Also, why not, uh, if you can, sort of at the end of that, a uh, step two of that question is, um, how can it be done badly? Because not everybody has a great experience doing it. So, so why don't you take that sort of question A, question B, and then we'll bring John in with a similar question. Okay, that's a great question because virtual assistants, I've come to think of them not just as virtual assistants, they are just an employee in your company and mm -hmm. they need to be an employee and every employee needs to be profitable. And you need to make sure you have a structure for every employee in your organization to be profitable. And with virtual assistants, the thing that's different is they are virtual. So if you have an office, you're not going to be able to just walk over there and say, what are you doing? You know, mm -hmm. management by walking around. So you're not going to be able to do that specifically. But with a virtual assistant, I would say, how can you use them? I would say, what can't they do? I've had a virtual assistant be able to do the acquisitions to where they were making calls, but also actually closing the deals over the phone, sending an agreement and getting those back from the sellers. I've been, I've seen two different companies now where they were managing 80 to hundred rentals. One was from the Philippines and John helped with that a lot. And then there was one in office person for property management. So they were helping call the late tenants, making sure the maintenance repairs were done, all of that stuff with property management. And I've seen it done on a smaller scale too, with 30 or 40 with a, another virtual assistant from India. So as long as you have, what you really need are systems in the structure to be able to come in and place that employee. Now, if you're starting out a business and you're saying, hey, why do I need a virtual assistant? They might be your best hire right out of the gate because maybe they can shadow you. You record everything you're doing while they're right there with you. They can see everything that you're doing. That I highly recommend recording your processes because then no matter who is in your business, a person right there or a virtual assistant, they'll be able to see how you do it. And if you try and write out everything every time, processes and, and websites change constantly. Yeah. So if, you're, uh, if you need to constantly update it, it's really tedious to do it like step by step on, a, on that type of thing. But I like video recording, especially with virtual assistants, because you can be walking them through that process, record it, and then say, okay, now here's the process. You've just created your own process map, basically, and you're having the virtual assistant learn that specific task. And now you can go and run with it because you can start that right out of the gate. When I first started Simple CFO Solutions, I said, I already knew John. So I knew that he, and I've worked with probably 10 or 15 virtual assistants over the past six years, and he was the best of the best. So I, want, I wanted him on my team <laughs> as soon as possible. And what I did basically when I first started was everything I did, I made sure I recorded, showed him, and then we have a video recording in our Google Drive. That's where we store those video recordings. So I would say it's very important, even if you don't have systems and processes, while you're showing people, record that. And then you'll have that system and process for the virtual assistant, and they'll be able to see the step-by-step -step of what they need to do. And you can manage it really well too, because you can see, well, here's the outline that you took did we see the end result? Cause like at the end of the day, they need to be profitable and actually either taking stuff off your plate that you shouldn't be doing to focus on high level tasks, or they should be actually producing income for you, whether that's making a call or whatnot. And you're training them like on that and that's role playing and recording just like a process map or something like that. And then what I see that a lot of investors don't do like that second part of your question. Yep was a lot of investors get the virtual assistant and even if they get them from a good company like rocket station or something that provides real estate investors with actual high level vas they think they're going to get them and then then just leave them alone and that they'll just kind of be integrated in the system without any guidance no they're an employee just like any other employee you wouldn't sit down with another employee and just say well, if you do, then that might be another issue in your <laughs> business and just say, here, do this process. And they have no idea what they're doing without you showing them. And then I would also say not having a weekly meeting or a daily meeting, depending on the task that you're giving them with property management. We had a daily meeting. It was a quick meeting, 15 to 30 minutes. And we covered four main areas with our virtual assistant and said, as long as we're good in these four areas, we, the rest of those issues kind of take care of themselves or the VA could actually take care of those issues. But if you don't have something like that, or you don't manage just like you would another employee, you're going to fail with a virtual assistant. The other part of failing with a virtual assistant is finding one that's not a great employee. Just yeah. like if you go through hiring an employee in your own organization, you're going to probably come across some bad apples. It's the same thing in the virtual assistant world too. You might come across some that aren't as stellar as some other virtual assistants. So it's like, as soon as you realize that, 
you know, it's slow to hire, quick to fire. It is that cliche, but it is so true. You need to be slow in your process of hiring anyone, making sure that they're an actual uh, rock star for you so they can actually take those stuff off of your plate so you can do the high level tasks or you, you know, that they're actually producing income for you. So that's really where I see a lot of people fail is just expecting them to know what they're supposed mm -hmm. to do and then leaving them alone. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, so John, uh, I'm curious from your perspective, having worked as a virtual uh, assistant for the last four years or so, um, you know, what, what, from your perspective, um, what are the, what are the, what are the challenges maybe first off? Um, and then, where do you, where do you really see virtual assistants adding, you know, being that positive investment to sort of key on what, what David was saying uh, for real estate investors? Cause again, I, I think a lot of people look to VAs as the silver bullet these days. Um, and with that comes, comes good and bad. So, so I'm curious from your perspective as the best of the best, where do you see VAs adding real value to small real estate businesses or real estate investors? And yeah, let's start there. Okay, well, um, as for the challenges, uh, well, what I think, uh, as, I, as David have mentioned earlier, it really boils down to how you're going to leverage the VA. Because when I started uh, as a VA or as a VA for the real estate, for a real estate investor, I actually have zero knowledge of real estate investing there in the US. Mm -hmm. So everything that I've learned, I learned from David. Um, so it's a matter of, you know, how, how you, you're going to train them, give them the tools that they needed to do their job. Yep. So if you do those things, I don't think your VA would have a lot of challenges or, you know, um, they'll basically be able to do the task with, without any problems. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll ask for the value that, uh, we can bring to, you know, the small business owners or the business yep. basically, um, well, um, that, I guess give some sample tasks if you were struggling. To, like, what what are some things you've done? Uh, obviously, the one I hear most about is cold calling or um, yeah, basically top of funnel stuff. But why don't you give a laundry list of all the things that you've seen VAs do? Because I think I think a lot of new investors uh, or new businesses aren't thinking out of the box. So why don't you give a sample of things uh, that you've seen done so maybe people can think, wow, these VAs can do so much more. Yeah, uh, so when I first started, um, yeah, I do cold calling. From, uh, I was in the acquisitions department, so I did those and then I was transferred to property management. Basically what I do there is I, I answer inquiry calls for potential renters and direct them to where they can view the property where they can submit an application uh, for their rental. And then after that, once we receive their application, I'm going to screen it. I call, I call the references, their previous landlords. And um, after that, um, I also call the, I also call the, the current renters mm -hmm. yep. or the current uh, tenants that we have, uh, those that are late. I proactively, uh, you know, call them, like uh, every day yeah. to, you know, follow up with their rent and also uh, data entries. Uh, I also, I'm also the one who organizes the Google Drive folder. I'm the one who uploads the receipts, the yeah. invoices, contracts and everything. And um, also um, I can, uh, we can do bookkeeping. Yep. So uh, we all, we can also do something with the finance and stuff. Very cool. Thank, thank you. I think it's interesting, um, at least in the real estate, and maybe it's just because I have a bias because I talk to lots of wholesalers and flippers, um, that there's a lot of bias to VAs just being that front of funnel, call, call owners, email them, you know, follow up on leads. And what I hear both you and, and David repeatedly saying is you can use the VAs for property management, which I have to admit is a foreign concept to me because I own lots of units and I pay a property manager and they have, they have 50 employees in Fresno or some, some number like that. And what I hear you saying is, you know, if you want to be your own property manager, maybe, maybe one of the ways you get there is by bringing on a VA who does kind of the bookkeeping follow up, all of that. Um, 
you know, maybe there's another way to think about it. So, so David, why don't you sort of pick up on that and really talk about VAs being part of a property management business. I think that's a interesting twist I haven't thought about. Sure. I'll give you the whole mindset behind it. It was, this was a task where I thought, okay, I'm doing these same things every day. I could teach someone to do this. This was something where I could, if I just sat down for a few hours, and I think that's where a lot of people struggle. They think this is going to take me way too long to do this. And they, they're trading two hours now for 20 hours consistently during a week. You know, mm -hmm. So like they're trading the short-term pain for that long-term gain where they don't think of the long-term solution where we actually, like John said, he just gave a small snippet and John is very humble. He does a lot of things, a lot of high level things that actually produce the results, like just calling those tenants and making sure we had a process to get the, the money in. We ran in that company where they had 80 to hundred rentals, we were running 95 to 99% collections a month mm. where we were getting that consistently every, and the quarter would always end in the high nineties, like 98, 99%. And we had one VA and one in-office person doing that. And the VA was really responsible for the task, for the income generating tasks, like following up with the leads, making sure they were there for the application signing, making sure that we scheduled the maintenance to keep the tenants currently happy and to make sure that the tenants who weren't paying on time, that they were constantly getting reminded or sending out the letters, you know, right away. So they could do everything like that. And like I said, it was basically taking a couple days out of the week and training someone specifically on those tasks, recording it and then having, and then watching them do it and maybe failing a little bit at the beginning, not as much. Maybe they were doing it 50 to 70% as well as I could right out of the gate. But then over time you're mm -hmm. coaching them, you have those daily meetings. And like I said, once we got to the daily meeting, we were going over four main points. We were going over maintenance, application slash marketing, tenant relations, who was on time and who wasn't, and then evictions and turnover. So we were going over those four main things daily and we got it down to a science to like 15 to 30 minutes. We were on the same page every day if he had any questions. So we, we got it down to where I was basically spending only 15 to 30 minutes a day on property management and seeing a result of 98 to 99% rent collections and just thinking, wow, this is pretty neat. And then we replicated in Virginia too. We've got, that's where I'm residing now. And the guy that I'm working with has 30 to 40 rentals and he's got one, one property manager, no in-house person or anything running those. And we're running about the same rate and he's doing the exact same thing. So we kind of replicated it there. And be, so a lot of the people that want to do in-house property management, a virtual assistant can be one way you can accomplish that because you say, well, let me think about what do what does the property manager do they ever really need to be in front of the tenant do they really with all the technology all of the stuff that you can do virtually now you've got rent lease to let people in and have those kind of automated systems where it like tracks who goes in there they have to all that stuff so you you think about that portion or like actually signing the lease well if you've got an online system now like buildium or apolio or whatever these property management softwares are you know you don't have to be in front of them to sign the lease you can do, uh, we would do a lot of virtual calls like this to sign the lease or something like that. And so any portion you think, well, no, only a, only me face to face can do this or someone in house, I would very much challenge that because of how we were doing it with a lot of rentals and you know about half that size too, where we just said, can someone in house do this versus a, a virtual assistant? And every single time we said, no, we can make this work with a virtual assistant. So that was really our mindset going into it and making sure they had the proper training and the proper meetings to make sure we were all on track every single week. That's, that's pretty amazing. And again, I fully admit to having my eyes opened. Uh, you know, I've been sitting here while you guys are going through this, thinking about what I pay my property manager to do. And yeah, there is a, I don't know, a fair portion of that busy work or activity that is, uh, I don't want to say almost, I guess it's almost monotonous. It's very repetitive. And yeah, there is no reason why somebody couldn't be in a foreign country making those same exact things. So uh, very eye-opening. I appreciate you both bringing this to our attention. Going back to your book, uh, I thought one topic we should really highlight is uh, your first point, which was know your numbers. I think, that's where, I think that's where a lot of businesses blow up, frankly, not only real estate, but really any business, right? Because when, when you're either A, looking at the wrong numbers, or B, calculating them incorrectly, you go out of business pretty quickly. So 
Yes. Why, don't, why don't you highlight and talk about what know your numbers mean, give some examples, and um, you know, we'll go from there. Sure. A lot of investors look at their bank accounts to see if they're okay, to see if they're <laughs> going to, if they're going to have a heart attack or not. Yeah. You know, like, do I need to worry about my finances today? Oh no, I've got, so, I've got money in there. Or it's like down to the pennies and it's like, we got to get money in there. Yeah. So that's how a lot of people really manage it right now. And that's how I've seen it done. What a lot of people don't realize is you need to make sure you have, you can even bank balance accounting where in profit first, it talks about that. Mm -hmm. But knowing your numbers, even before that, a lot of people think, well, I don't want to be a bookkeeper. I don't really care. A lot of investors just say the finances, that's just, that's not something that I want to do or whatnot. Yeah. But even if you've read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you know that one of his main points is you need to know something about accounting. Now, that does not mean that you need to know how to enter every single transaction or you need to be doing every single transaction. But you need to know it's going into the right buckets mm -hmm. and going into the right places so you can get those reports. Let's take a property that you're fixing and flipping. A lot of people do fixing and flipping properties. But when you buy that property, it's an asset on your books. And the money you're actually spending, If you, let's say you've also got a loan to cover like the purchase price and the repairs like a lot of people get. So if you did, if you did get that, because I see a lot of people using private money, hard money, you mm -hmm. know, or whatever type, but even bank financing with an FHA 203k loan or something, they've got all that money to cover the expenses. Well, a lot of people think, well, that money goes into my account and then I pay that out and then it all gets commingled. You know, you've got your money in there from the income. You've got Joe Blow who's given you all this money for this one house. Well, if you have a fix and flip on your books, it's really not going to hit your actual P&L until you sell the property because you're basically holding that asset until you sell it. So to make it simple, you need to know what you're spending on the property and you can do that really easily in accounting software as long as you're working with a good bookkeeper who knows how to allocate that and allocate it like you want to see it. I would say what you really need to do is be an owner. You need to say, this is what I want to see give it to me in the way I want to see it. And your bookkeeper needs to be able to say, here you go, you know, like kind of on a silver platter. And that's what we really specialize in because some bookkeepers don't know what the owners want to see or how to get there. And that's really what we're able to do and say on this fix and flip, this is what you've spent on, you know, as a total, if you want to break it down into actual, like the major systems or whatnot too, we can do that. But so you can see it on the, like the micro level of an actual, uh, where you're seeing it from the you know nitty gritty point of view, but then also you need to see the bigger picture when you actually sell the houses and you say, what did I actually make? And is my company healthy? Because at the end of the day, your business, you want to be a business. What about a house? Think about the houses that you sell. If you're selling a fix and flip, I'm pretty sure you want retail buyers calling you and not a wholesaler calling you to, for that property. Same thing with your business. You need to know your numbers to know if a, a potential buyer were to come and buy your business. Hey, is this going to be a wholesale buyer coming to buy my business or is this going to be a retail buyer coming to buy my business? So, and I want to challenge owners in saying, you don't really need to get in and do the actual bookkeeping. You need to be that owner who says, this is what I need to see. This is how I want to see it. Get it for me because it can be done because as long as you are tracking every single purchase and, you know, intake the outgo inside of some sort of system, you'll be able to manipulate the numbers to be exactly what you need to be to, to get what you need for the, to increase your profit, to decrease those expenses. So really knowing your numbers is very key. And then at the end of the day, you need to know it from the property level and also from the business overall to see what type of buyer that would come and buy your business. Very, very cool. Well, David, do me a favor, flash the book one more time, highlight where they can get it. Where can they do some more research on you and your company? Uh, because again, sure. I think there's a lot of people that have, will probably have lots of questions off this interview. So how can they get a hold of you? Okay, simplecfosolutions.com. I actually, I actually, my business is unique. I only work with 10 investors a quarter because I am very, I want to make sure I'm bringing the value that I can bring those investors. Like right now we're at capacity for quarter four, 2019, and we have a few open slots for 2020. But if you go to, to that website, simplecfosolutions.com, you can apply there. There's also a business health checkup that I give on there too. Like if you go on there just to see kind of some questions to be thinking about that go a little bit more into knowing your numbers and whatnot. 
So if you go to simplecfosolutions.com, that's where you can get that information. As far as the book goes, if you go onto my website too, there's a tab at the top that says Recession Proof Business. You can go there and it's got a link to Amazon. Or if you go to Amazon and type in Less Stress, More Profit for real estate investors, that's where it is also. David, thank you very much for this. John, any closing thoughts uh, from your perspective? Um, yeah, well, uh, yeah, thank you very much for having mm -hmm. us. And um, yeah, for as for the VA, yeah, it's just a matter of how you can leverage them. And um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. <laughs> very cool. Well, guys, I want to thank you very much for doing this, David. Thanks for coming on. Thank you very much for inviting John to join us. It's always fun to have this multi-discussion. Uh, uh, I think virtual assistants are something more and more people should look at. And then you opened my eyes, as I said earlier, to the fact that uh, maybe I'm not thinking about all the ways I could use them. So I appreciate, appreciate you guys' time. Have a great day. Thank you. Hopefully we brought thank some you. value. And you have a great day too, Mike. Yep, you got it. Thanks, guys. Yep.